Sabal uh, Kher. We are going to get started. Um, apologies for the slight delay. Um, I was also in the keynote for those of you that were in the opening session and um, was thrilled to hear the remarks from the speakers, but um, what I was most not only interested in, but um, humbled by was the theme of this conference and the ability for all of us to really reflect on that theme, um, this idea of beyond grades. And that has a huge impact, obviously, on our students, but then our practice and what does that mean for our practice. And so we're going to talk about that today in our session. Um, and we're going to talk about how we can embrace that idea as adults and apply it to ourselves as adults. Um, in the US, where I'm from, there's a huge movement, there has been over the last five to 10 years, in policy and federal legislation to evaluate teachers and to give teachers a grade. And that has most often translated into teachers not innovating because they're so concerned about getting the answer right, just as students are concerned about getting the answer right. So fortunately, we have been able to have that debate over the last five to 10 years, and we're starting to see things shift just a little bit. Um, and one of the critical things that is helping with that shift is teachers' voice and teachers standing up and saying, we want to innovate, we have clear structures that allow us to debate whether our practice is good or not good enough, and we have evidence to show you that we're improving our practice, and that evidence is beyond a grade that the principal is giving me, or whoever the evaluator is. And a key aspect of that is the agency that teachers have. And that's what this session is all about, giving teachers agency through collaboration to provide other evidence to whoever is watching as an observer, teachers grow their practice. Whether that be the principal, another teacher, a parent, a student, or a policymaker. And so this session is certainly about some of the structures around collaboration and some of the lessons that we've learned. But I think even more importantly, it's about shifting the conversation to teachers as innovators and this structure serving a key role in that to influence how policymakers are thinking about teachers, how principals, how students, et cetera. And so I just wanted to frame the conversation a little bit that way based on your session, uh, your conference rather, the theme of your conference and the remarks that we just heard and the power of those remarks. And so I would encourage you to think about this session and the structures that we're gonna talk about for professional learning communities through that lens. Um, so welcome everyone. My name is Jason Stricker and I'm the CEO of an organization called Insight Education Group. Um, I consider myself a learner more than a CEO and um, I was formerly a first grade teacher and an 11th grade teacher and I learned a lot from my students. What I learned in first grade is that reading is a gateway skill for students and it impacts everything they do from the the rest of their lives. It is a gateway not just to success in education, but to success in their life. And based on that powerful learning lesson from my first grade students, I wanted to apply that to students in high school who had not experienced success in reading, who were three or more years below grade level in reading. And so I went and taught 11th grade, American literature. And while the content was important around American literature, what was more important to me is that I taught students how to access that literature through the reading skills. Um, and was able to, I took the lowest students in this particular school, and another teacher was teaching the AP students. My goal that year was to grow my students as much, if not more, than the AP students next door to prove that that was possible. That the thinking that my students wanted to engage in, they had the ability to think just like an AP student, even though they weren't labeled advanced placement. 
Um, and at the end of the year, I saw many of my students, about 85% of them, see more growth in one year than the AP students' growth in that same year. So the reason I share that story is because everything I do as the CEO of this organization is through that lens, through that teacher lens, and that teachers have an incredibly powerful voice and obviously a powerful impact on students. So all of these structures and the things that we're going to talk about are filtered through um, that lens, the lens of the teacher, and how can we empower teachers um, to be innovators and to have high expectations for students, regardless of what their label is. So currently we work with teachers, but we also work with education leaders in schools, in state offices, in districts throughout the US, um, and now here in Jordan. We are just engaging, we're about three years into a project with QRTA called the Advanced Leadership Project, um, where we are training principals throughout Jordan. And um, it's been a fascinating and wonderful experience and um, have really grown to learn a lot from that experience and from those individuals. So that's what brings me here, and that's why I'm here. Um, our work is around these areas, school improvement, leadership development, and teacher growth, but we don't think about it from one perspective. We think about how to connect all of those pieces so that we're not operating in silos. We're not just focusing on teachers, but we're asking leaders, are you putting the conditions for success in place for teachers to grow in your building? And that's what this session is about as well professional learning communities, do we have condi conditions for success in place that leaders, if you're a leader in this room, what are the conditions in place that you're, put, that you're setting up for your teachers? If you're a teacher in this room, how am I using those conditions? Are we collaborating and, and what does that collaboration look like? So our objectives today. We're going to look at some research base that serves as the foundation for this collaboration model. Um, and it really is about empowering teachers to be problem solvers. We're also going to look at a framework that will help guide that collaboration so it's not so open-ended that it takes us so much time to figure out how to just get started. There are some guardrails. There are some structures. Simultaneously, though, those structures allow us to still be innovators within those guardrails and, and solve our own problems. So that's the dilemma and balance we're going to examine in that second framework or that second objective. And then finally, what are some next steps for enhancing teacher collaboration that leads, hopefully, to student improvement? So to start, I thought I would just ask you, because when we started this journey around professional learning communities, and I'll talk about that journey in just a minute, the very first thing we did was just ask teachers, what's helpful to you and what's not helpful from the perspective in relation to collaboration? So collaboration is most helpful when, collaboration is not helpful when. I'd love for you to take just 60 seconds to talk with someone next to you about that, and then we'll, we'll uh, debrief and talk a little bit as a group. All right, welcome back. Let's talk just for a minute, if I could get some volunteers to share some responses. Let's start with helpful. Collaboration is helpful when? Organized, great. Thank you. Collaboration is also helpful when? When there is a clear, clear goals. Clear goals. Fantastic. Okay. What else? Collaboration is helpful when? Uh, when there is confidence. When there's confidence. Terrific. What else? Yes. When there's open-mindedness among the group. Great. When there's open-mindedness. Open minds in the group. Yes. Collaboration is helpful when? Yeah, great. When it is not enforced. It's not a compliance exercise. Yes. Outcomes. When there are some outcomes that are expected. Great. When it's outcome focused. Terrific. Yes. Terrific. So when we have, when time is given. Great. When is it not helpful? One more. Voices heard. Great. It's not helpful when? 
It could be just the opposite of these things, right? Is there anything, though, that you think is really important to call out on the not helpful side that is just not the opposite of one of these? Ah, thank you. When there is competition, that's interesting. When there's no plan. Anything else? Yes. There are special interests. When there ah, uh, when there are special interests, dare I say agendas that are personal. Domination of power. One more. When there's a lack of trust. Lack of trust. So we could build this list probably pretty extensively and add a lot more items on each side. One more. Ah. Yep. Not data driven. Okay. So these are all the things that we heard when we asked teachers. Why? When is collaboration helpful and not helpful? And interestingly enough, very similar lists that emerged. But then we asked principals, do you require teachers to collaborate in PLCs? And almost uniformly, the answer was yes, absolutely. How many of those teachers attend? Less than 20% attend those collaboration sessions. So the sort of inference was that the collaboration sessions were more like this than they were like this. And so we set out to figure out how to change that. And that's what this structure that we're going to talk a little bit about is intended to do. And so we started with kind of with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation around this assumption that we have to figure out how to empower, obviously, teachers so that they feel like they have more voice, they have clear goals, it's outcome focused in their collaboration, all those things that we listed. And the foundation said, well, let's look outside of education to see if there are other professionals in other fields that are solving their own problems, that feel like their collaboration is more helpful than not helpful. And one of the very first places that we looked was to this research around positive deviance. Now, if we had had an hour and a half or more, I would have given you an article on positive deviance, a very short article, and we would have unpacked it and talked about it. That article is up here, so at the end, if you want it, please feel free to grab it. I'm just going to tell you a quick summary via one or two stories of what positive deviance is about, because that frames why the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation wanted to invest in this idea of improving teacher collaboration. So with the foundation, our research led us to an NGO that was working in Vietnam. And the NGO was trying to solve malnutrition in Vietnam. And malnutrition had been a perplexing problem. It had been something that Vietnam was struggling with for decades. So we started to, with that NGO, or look at what the NGO did. And the very first thing they did was just go in and study. They went in and just observed villages in Vietnam to figure out what was happening. The first thing that they found was that there are some families within a village and certainly some families across villages where kids are not malnourished. So while malnutrition was widespread in Vietnam, there were bright spots. There were examples of families and children living in Vietnam that were not malnourished. And so the next thing that this NGO set did was study those families. They simply observed what was going on in the day-to-day -day lives of these families. What they found was that generally one of the main things that is fed to children in Vietnam is soup. They make soup, it's easy to make, it's relatively cheap, and it has shrimp and potatoes and all kinds of nourishment but the very simple practice of ladling the soup from the top of the pot that they're cooking and giving that first bowl of soup to the children was well intended 
but it had a bad unintended consequence. All of the nourishment had seeped to the bottom, settled at the bottom of those pots. And so what the children were getting, through good intention, because the families wanted to feed children first, was a lack of any of that nourishment. They weren't getting any of that. So it took weeks and weeks to figure out that very simple solution. But it was through the study. Yes, there is a very simple solution. Ladle from the bottom or stir it first. So once they figured that out, they wanted to understand, could they replicate that practice across the country? They wanted to understand if context was important, if only in those certain families did, were they the only ones that were doing that practice, or would other families be open to cooking the same soup, stirring it, ladling from the bottom? And through trial and error, they figured out the answer was yes. Fast forward to the end of the story a couple of years later, they reduced the incidence of malnourishment tremendously. They reduced it by nearly 85%. And so when you think about the huge impact that that has on the lives of those individuals and on that country, it is huge. And it comes from this concept of positive deviance, which is one of the pillars of this professional learning community model that I'm going to share with you. Positive deviance is that there are bright spots. There are bright spots in every practice. We simply have to look and find them. Even in the midst of really difficult, vexing problems like malnutrition across an entire country, we can find a bright spot. And if we look hard enough and figure out how to replicate that, we can solve that vexing problem. That's one of the foundations for this model called STEP, Supporting Teacher Effectiveness Project. And when the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation read about that, they wanted to understand were other professionals in other sectors doing this outside of this NGO. And they found multiple examples of this. They found this in the healthcare sector. In the US, they found doctors who solved this vexing problem of making patients sicker than when they, came, when they left the hospital than when they came in. And they were making patients sicker because they weren't washing their hands adequately or scrubbing in and out of a room. They called it checking in and out of a room using hand sanitizer. But it wasn't until doctors actually raised the red flag themselves and said, why are we making patients sicker? and saw that in some departments that wasn't happening. They went to those other departments in the same hospital, studied what they were doing, and they were just using better hand sanitation practices. So there are multiple examples of this across different sectors. We wanted to apply that to education. And it was through STEP that we applied that. So the first truth, though, that we applied was that nobody knows teaching like teachers. Nobody knows their practice better than the people who are practicing it. So an outside consultant can't go into a teacher and say, do this or do that. Teachers have to be empowered to figure out what the problem is and how to solve their own solution, find their own solution. The second truth that we discovered was this idea of the plateau effect. This comes from some research out of Harvard, and this was specific in this case to math achievement. But essentially what it says is that after three or four years of teaching, our learning as individuals, as teachers, starts to plateau. And therefore, our value add to students plateaus. As a first-year teacher, I have so much to learn about my craft. And if I'm hungry to learn that, I will learn a tremendous amount. My learning curve is steep. As a second year teacher, I'm gonna to continue to learn. Now I have the basic principles of classroom management, of basic pedagogy down, and I'm gonna perfect those. That learning continues to get better as my third year, but by the fourth year, that learning plateaus, and therefore my transfer of effective teaching and learning practices to students also plateaus. So students stop learning from a fourth year teacher. Imagine a 20-year veteran. So we wanted to understand this and apply it to this positive deviant or this uh, collaboration practice 
If nobody knows teachers better than teaching, yet learning plateaus, why is learning plateau? Are we not empowering teachers to be learners and innovators? That was the question that we asked. So to reconcile those two things, we came up with this idea that the key is knowing when a change is an improvement. Because this plateau happens because we are asked, and I'm sure many of you have been asked to implement new instructional strategies, new curricular programs, new interventions, whatever it is, over and over and over again, sometimes without enough time to give fidelity to that intervention to work. And when that happens over and over to an individual teacher, we start to lose confidence in the system. We start to lose confidence in the leaders who are trying to put conditions in place for success. We don't feel empowered anymore. So we just asked this simple question, and it is the foundation of this collaboration model because we think it reconciles the two truths. Nobody knows teachers teaching better than teachers. And if we ask them, rather than tell them what to do, and ask them, how do you know when a change is an improvement in your classroom, we think we start to get closer to the helpful side of collaboration and further away from the not helpful side. So we started to dig deeper into what does improvement really mean? What does improvement really mean? And we have some very helpful research to answer that question. It comes from improvement science. The Carnegie Foundation, based out of Stanford University, has done a lot of thinking about improvement science. They've come up with these six principles of improvement. The first principle being make the work problem specific and user-centered. So the work is coming from teachers. And it's not, we need to improve student achievement. That is much too general. The work is, how do I use a better academic vocabulary strategy in my classroom? That is much more problem specific because my students are not able to access the academic vocabulary in a biology class to understand the concepts. That helps us improve much faster than the general question, how do I improve student achievement? much too general and broad. The second principle, variation in performance is the core problem to address. We talked about this yesterday in our workshop, if you were with us, that there is more variation in one single building than there is across buildings. And what's interesting about that is from a parent perspective, imagine putting your student in that building and having to advocate for teachers. I do this with my own kids. Many parents do this if you're a parent. You try to identify from other parents, from your own observations, which is the best first grade teacher, and you want your student, you want your child in that first grade teacher's classroom. So reducing that variation is critical in order to bring equity to this idea of improvement. See the system that produces the current outcomes. That's simply about observation. Let's observe what the current system is doing and comprised of, and what are the outcomes it's producing and study that so that we could try to affect different variables. We cannot improve at scale what we can't measure. Data, a lack of data is not helpful. Data is helpful because it helps us answer that question, how do you know when a change is an improvement? Data, though, is not just quantitative data or student test scores. To link to your theme for your conference beyond grades, it can be observation. It can be student perception of how good that teacher is doing, which is a very valid instrument, by the way, if you use valid surveys for that. So measuring the improvement is really important in order to make this collaboration helpful. So that as the collaborative group, imagine if you three at this front table are a collaboration team, and you're trying different strategies in your classrooms, but you have no way to determine the effect of those strategies? The answer is obvious, but we do this all the time. We try a new strategy because we saw it at a conference or we read it in a book, but we don't study the effect of that really closely. We don't study it especially before we scale that strategy. So rather than trying that new strategy out of that book or from the conference in one classroom, I often hear principals or school leaders say, I want all of my teachers to use 
non-linguistic representations because it's a Marzano research-based strategy without really studying when and where is a non-linguistic representation most impactful. That's really important. So we have to measure the impact of our implementation of these strategies. We cannot improve at scale what we can't measure. Anchoring practice improvement in disciplined inquiry. This is simply about the cycle of plan, do, study, act. Let's plan for an intervention. Let's study whether it worked or do it. Let's study if it worked and then let's act. Do we need to, re do we need to modify that intervention in some way? And then finally, accelerate improvements through networked communities. Rather than keeping improvement siloed or isolated to one teacher, let's spread and scale that through these networked communities. So these six core principles serve as another foundation for this model that we're going to talk about. So the two foundational principles, my first objective was understand the research that undergirds or it serves as the foundation for this professional learning community model. The first is positive deviance. Remember Vietnam. The second is improvement science. Remember these principles. They serve as really critical aspects of this model that we developed. So here's what STEP is. STEP is the model. We call it STEP. In every school community, there are certain uncommon behaviors and strategies being practiced that enable better solutions. Those better solutions can be found despite having the same access to resources. So even if I don't have the best or latest curriculum, I still can get impact with my students. That's what STEP is all about. We have to find those bright spots. This is really about finding the bright spots. It's the story from Vietnam. Find the families who were serving their students from the bottom of the pot, their kids from the bottom of the pot. So positive deviance and improvement science, these are some of the characteristics. We've talked about these, but they serve as the foundation for STEP. So the STEP framework is something that we developed to help guide teachers through this process. One of the things that we said is helpful is that it's organized. Collaboration needs to be organized. That was interesting that that came up in the very beginning. The first thing that was helpful. So we developed this framework. This framework, though, came from a trial and error process. It actually came from a failure. We tried to implement positive deviance in schools without a framework. Because true adherence to positive deviance says that you don't provide any guidance to the practitioners. You just give them time and space to identify their own problems. Those problems will bubble up on their own and then give teachers time and place, space to find solutions. The solutions will become self-evident. We tried that. It failed miserably. It failed because teachers were asking us, we just continued to ask about how this was working, this process of positive deviance, and they said, we don't have enough, enough structure and we don't have enough time to figure out what that structure should look like. So we want time to be creative and innovative, but give us a little bit of structure. So we came up with this framework. And the framework is simply this, seek, discover, confirm, and share. It says, for every professional learning community, the very first thing you do is seek a common problem of practice. And we developed tools that are now in a playbook to help facilitate the identification of a problem of practice. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But that's the first step. Data is hugely in helpful in that. We use all kinds of data, observation data, certainly benchmark data, any standardized test data student perceptions. We use all of that data to identify what's the common problem of practice. The grain size of the problem was also incredibly important. It can't be too broad, like student achievement. Academic vocabulary is a much easier, more helpful, specific, user-centered problem to address when we apply the principles of improvement science. So seek the common problem that emerges from the data and find a grain size that you can study. Discover those uncommon practices. Who is teaching academic vocabulary and getting different results given the same resources that we all have? Dare I say better results? 
That's discover. Confirm. If you're a teacher teaching academic vocabulary and getting those uncommon results, is that simply because you have something unique in you that you've connected to the students better, whatever it is, that we can't replicate in other classrooms? That's what we try to answer in the confirm stage through trying that academic vocabulary strategy in your, all of your classrooms, confirming whether or not, measuring whether or not it worked, and then deciding if we want to share that across other classrooms and really scale this strategy. That guards against the idea of initiative fatigue or strategy fatigue for teachers who feel this idea that I'm asked to do a, a new strategy every other week and I simply can't learn the strategy fast enough, but my principal is asking me to do all of these new strategies or interventions. So we guard against that. The other consequence, by the way, of asking teachers to do all of these strategies and use new interventions is we run out of resources quickly. We want run out of not only our human resource and ability to try new strategies and understand them, we run out of dollars and money to implement these. And then we get in this cycle of not having enough money so we can't innovate anymore. So before we, want it, before we get to that place, we want to confirm whether or not strategies work before we scale them. That's what STEP is all about. STEP is generally, this is not a prescription, but in our experience, we tried STEP in about five different places in the US, and we're starting to use it internationally now. This is generally what it looks like in practice. There's 12 to 16 teachers in a STEP group. They're weekly meetings that are facilitated by a coach. They are not facilitated by the principal. Weekly meetings that are facilitated by a teacher leader usually, a department head perhaps, a coach in the building, something like that. And the meetings are about an hour long, before or after school, maybe during common planning time. There are also monthly coach meetings. So not only are teachers collaborating in, the, in this, but whoever's facilitating that process, if you have multiple coaches in, different, in a building or across different buildings, they're collaborating as well to say what worked in our collaboration session last week and what didn't work. So you have learning happening at different levels. You have learning happening at the teacher level, learning happening at the facilitator or coach level as well. There are some supports that are provided. There's a summer boot camp for coaches. It's a three-day boot camp in which we learn about some of the key ingredients to STEP, one of those being really good facilitation, and we teach those facilitation strategies and practices to those coaches. In addition to that, we will sometimes do some, we will sometimes facilitate the monthly coach meetings to observe what's working and not working. Those are sometimes facilitated internally by coaches themselves though. And then there's a step playbook, a how-to guide with vetted resources. So we've implemented step for about six years now and we've continued to evolve this playbook. The playbook is organized by according to these phases. So there's a series of strategies for facilitating the seek phase, a series of strategies for facilitating the discover phase. We've learned that some of those strategies don't work and some really work well. And so those that work well make it into the new version of the playbook each year and those that don't are vetted out. So I want to show you a video to hear from people who have actually used STEP, how they're interpreting it and how valuable or not it is to them. It's a short video and then we'll have a quick discussion. Yes. Yes. It is published. If the question is the book, the playbook, and I'll be happy to afterwards send you um, a link to pieces of the playbook so you can start to look at it and uh, use it. Volume on the video. Built in. The greatest challenges our teachers face, as well as our administrators, is all the multiple demands that are placed on them from federal, state government, local government, and just the needs of our students. Obviously, you want to reach every student every day, and um, you want to provide the best education possible for them, um, which means being prepared yourself 
And a lot of times that requires that we step outside of our classroom and collaborate with our peers. The way we've been looking at our challenges in the last two decades, to be very honest with you, is that professional development. STEP comes into the play where you can differentiate. STEP itself is supporting teacher effectiveness project and really supporting teachers to do their magic in the classroom. It's based on a process called positive deviance. You start off with the with the observation that there are individuals within a particular community who have maybe uncommon approaches to, to different things, but somehow they're getting successful results. Yet they have the same resources, same constraints, same expectations as everyone else. STEP emphasizes the fact that the answers to the questions are right here. We don't have to look to the outside, but everything we need to bring about solutions are right here among us. So it's teachers collaborating with teachers teachers coming up with solutions um, to issues that are in the classroom every day. Being on a STEP team is, is a completely voluntary um, process and it's when you step up to STEP you're saying I trust my colleagues, I may be a little nervous but I'm really interested in this reflective learning process. With STEP the teachers are working together as a group and they are deciding where they need help and what's relevant to, to their needs and to their students. We have schools that are focused on collaborative discussions, academic vocabulary, mathematics, uh, you name it. So it starts there where the teachers are, are making that decision about what it is they're going to focus in on. Then they're able to go to their colleagues and try to find out by observation, interviewing teachers, interviewing students, and figuring out who's already figured this out. Who's doing well? We, we have teachers already making changes in their classroom. STEP is important to help teachers try to connect that with the data as to are these practices really effective? And they, and, they, and they come together and they start to analyze that data and analyze their observation data. And they determine that, you know, teacher A is having great success. Let's go learn from teacher A. Let's all try it in our classrooms. And then if it really works, if it's effective, if it's something that we all can do, then let's share it with, the, with our entire school site. So that students are hearing one message, and then of course, you know, because there's such an impact throughout their day, they're going through six teachers and hearing the same message, they, they just academically, they start to improve. And so that's, that's what's so powerful about this project. Good morning, third period. Good morning, Ms. I see a bigger change in um, teachers' enthusiasm for working together, for collaborating. Things are more positive. Um, there was more of an approach of, I'm going to try something new. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to give it a shot. And I, I see a more positive, you know, push to innovate. STEP has changed my way of thinking and approaching problems in the classroom just in that I feel empowered to solve those problems myself. I don't uh, look towards, you know, administration to tell me and wait for administration to guide me. Um, if there's a problem, I bring it to the table and then we work from there. So STEP um, has provided me that that opportunity. It's really coming from that collective voice, which is really, really important. And the superintendent has to, doesn't have to say, you have to do X, Y, and Z. What's my job then becomes, how do I support X, Y, and Z if it's getting a good byproduct? We all want to be our best, and to be working at that together with your colleagues is um, just going to be a real accelerator. It is exactly what education has needed uh, for a very, very long time. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about this. I'll give you about 60 seconds. Turn and talk to a partner. These three questions, what are teachers and leaders actually saying about STEP? What did you hear them talk about? How did STEP enhance their ability to improve? And what was most compelling to you as you listened and processed this video? About 60 seconds and then we'll talk. All right, welcome back everyone. Um, I wanna just focus on that third question, what was most compelling to you? and just hear from some of you kind of where your thoughts are right now um, related to sort of this framework called STEP. We're in my second objective, which was to analyze a framework for enhancing teacher collaboration. We talked about the research base, moved on to the second objective, did a couple of different things. I walked you through the framework, watched the video. So this is really the last piece of accomplishing that objective, which was to analyze the framework for collaboration. 
we're going to analyze it finally through some of uh, just a very brief dialogue as a whole room now, now that you've had an opportunity to dialogue briefly. So what were some things that were most compelling to you? Yes. It's like an authentic process. It's realistic. It's come from my side, my needs. It's not yes. from other side or another one perspective to tell me what to do. Great. So the improvement science principle being user-centered. It's coming from your perspective. It is driven completely by teachers, the problems and the solutions. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for waiting. Thanks. Uh, I like the idea when the teacher said, it's all here. We don't have to look outside. That was amazing. Yeah. Looking back and reflecting to our experience in big schools where we have a large number of teachers, a wide variety of experiences. So I believe if, if we could uh, implement that, that would be amazing. Absolutely. Because next door you'd have a teacher having excellent classroom management, then another teacher with great time management skills. And look at that when we share that. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. The answer lies within. And it gets to this idea that it's not sort of driven from the top. It's really about this concept of it's not enforced. You heard in the video that it's a completely voluntary process. In Long Beach, where this video was shot, where it was taken, the footage, what we see is that prior to STEP, there was less than 20% attendance at professional learning collaboration time. Fast forward three years of implementing STEP, greater than 80% attendance, completely voluntary. Principals didn't have to say, you need to come here because it's part of your job description. Teachers were getting a lot of value out of this for a lot of the reasons you're stating, because it was very user-centered. The answer lied within. They wanted to do more of it. They were hungry for it. Anything else that was particularly compelling? What? Yes. Yes. Great. I'll repeat the question. Um, if you want to implement this, how do you select the coach? We have a set of coach competencies that I'm happy to share with you. They're not part of the presentation. I can share some of those uh, resources with you. There's no prescription for selecting the coach. Generally, what we found is let's leverage the structures that exist within the building. So if you already have a coach, you might have a math coach, a literacy coach, a general instructional coach. Let's leverage that individual or a set of individuals so we don't have to buy another resource. This is not about finding a step coach outside of your existing structure. That coach might also be a department head who is a veteran teacher who has a track record of success, who we want to move in professionally. We want them to grow professionally. Remember that plateau effect that I shared with you? Teachers leave the profession in the U.S. at a really high rate. The best teachers leave the profession in the U.S. at a high rate because they're not being grown professionally. It's not about their pay. It's not about the conditions. It's not about any of those things. It's about their inability to grow as a professional. And so selecting a department lead or a veteran teacher, someone like that, to, it gives them a pathway to grow as a professional to now facilitate these conversations, which was an unintended benefit that we didn't anticipate when we implemented this. But we learned about that structure along the way. So those are two ideas for how you can leverage existing resources so you don't have to buy another resource. Um, yes, one more question and then we're going to keep moving and I'm happy to spend time afterwards too answering questions. Okay, I want to ask about uh, the variety we have in PLCs. Mm -hmm. So how many kinds of PLCs yeah. we, we, we have? Yeah, great. So the PLCs in STEP, they could be grade level PLCs, just third grade teachers collaborating. They could be interdisciplinary professional learning communities where we have the biology teacher working with the social studies teacher, working with the math teacher and the ELA teacher. We don't set those boundaries. What we say is let's find through data, the SEEK process, a common problem in the SEEK process. What is the problem we're trying to solve? And as a community, once we've identified that problem, that often drives the composition of the team. What we talked about yesterday was a leadership team, a professional leadership team, who through data and improvement goals that they already have set, 
create some guardrails for what we're going to study and seek. So for example, if I know that reading achievement between kindergarten and third grade is really poor, I want to study that and I want to figure out why. And so I might say as a leadership team to my teachers, please study this because we know it's a pervasive problem in our school, in our community. What I don't say to teachers though is, you third grade teacher have to study it with that second grade teacher, with that first grade teacher, and here's exactly what you need to study. That's the creativity and innovation that's allowed in STEP. However, there are some guardrails, and we learned this lesson after implementing STEP, quite frankly, for one or two years, because we gave no guardrails first to the problem that teachers were seeking, and what happened was it took them so long to find a common problem, they lost the momentum in the process. They got discouraged so much that they stopped coming to STEP meetings. So the guardrails helped. And it's about having a conversation around those guardrails rather than saying, you will do this. So the conversation and the facilitation of those guardrails is really important as well. But those are some of the lessons we've learned about, to your question, the types of PLCs, they can range, but what might drive who's collaborating are the problems, the types of problems you're trying to solve. Yeah, so that's right. And you formed another one, so there's a PLC within the PLC. Yeah, let's simplify it a little bit more. And the professional learn, the, the leadership team, the professional leadership team gave kind of some direction to the professional learning community. So two layers of collaborators, leadership and teachers. Leadership just says, who some, oftentimes has teachers sitting on that leadership team, Here's our common problem. They give that problem with, through communication to teachers. Teachers then start the seek phase. Let's use the example I just gave. Reading achievement between kindergarten and third grade. The leadership team says, we need to study that. That's your guardrail. What they don't do is tell teachers specific things that are going wrong. Here's the specific problem. Is your problem phonemic awareness in first grade? Is your problem fluency as you move from second to third grade? Is your problem comprehension strategies? It, we don't as a leadership team dictate any of that. We give teachers the autonomy to study where the problem exists within that broad construct of reading achievement between kindergarten and third grade. So the PLC is seeking a more granular problem that they want to study and therefore a more granular solution. So that's how it starts to play out. Um, let's go to what's been the impact of STEP? Because if I'm sitting in your seat, I want to know, does this really work? <laughs> this guy standing in front of me has shared some good stories, but does it really work? And so this is an example of what some of the teachers that we've worked with have started to produce. We asked this question, how has ste STEP impacted your work as a teacher so far? And these are some of the responses we got. They built common assessments. Rather than someone handing them some assessments, they built common assessments that were often project-based, authentic, rich assessments. They felt like they had some new teaching strategies. Their tools around teaching were improving. They also felt like there was a better open door policy. STEP provided this structure for me to come into another teacher's classroom. Because part of STEP, remember, is observing what works in one teacher's classroom and then asking, will that work in mine? So it inherently created this sort of open door policy. Prior to that, in Long Beach, principals had tried to implement peer feedback and peer observation, and it failed miserably because the teachers perceived it as a compliance piece. They perceived it as something that I have to do on my common planning period because my principal told me. But I don't really know why I'm going into a teacher's classroom and what I'm looking for. So STEP provided some of those guardrails and empowerment for teachers to do that. So they felt like there was a much more open door policy. Multiple perspectives, obviously, through the STEP group. We're sharing multiple perspectives, collaboration with other grade levels and departments, and then self-reflection on my own teaching practices. So those are from 
the impact that teachers voice to us. We tried to, we studied some of the data that was coming out. Well, we found that there was certainly increased collaboration with one another to the effect of 92% of the step teachers reported they're communicating more with their fellow teachers about specific practices. 100% of teachers reported participation in step team provided them opportunities to learn from one another. 92% reported increased collaboration. This was uh, six schools across, and the schools each had roughly 500 teachers across all six. Yeah, so it's about a sample size of 500. Applied new data literacy skills. Improved instructional practices. By the way, data is a through line. It's an incredible, it is the through line. We used a lot of data in each phase of step to seek the problem of practice, to find a promising solution, to confirm, obviously, whether or not it works, and to share it. Um, and then increase teacher leadership opportunities. To your question earlier about coaches, six out of 10 of this schools in this most recent year reported that they feel like they have been able to implement to a full teacher leadership model. They feel like they're growing professionally. Here's some of the student performance data. So some of the indicators are on the left here, right? Sample indicators, the percent of students who justify their word choice in class group discussions. 15% was baseline, increased to 30 37% at the end of this step cycle. 22% change. Percent of teachers reporting that more than 75% of their students can orally explain their reasoning using mathematical language. Such a powerful concept. 18 to 56%. And a percent of teachers reporting most students participate in class discussion, 46 to 70 percent. If we want to promote critical thinking, students have to carry the cognitive load. Students have to do the thinking. That's what they were trying to impact in this step study, that, or the problem that they were studying. And these are some of the impacts that they got. So here's some of the benefits. We're reducing variability of instruction. We're testing solutions. The capacity to continue finding great practice. Some considerations around that. Do you have the data systems in place to do this kind of study? It could be an Achilles heel, something that prevents you from really doing step well. If you don't have the ability to report out on data, you need to build those systems. Competing initiatives, we have too much going on. So before we implement step, we ask principals, is this right for your school? Have you just taken on two really big things that don't give you time and space to do another? And then willingness to test curriculum and instruction. So how this plays out is in some of the schools that we went into, teachers told us, I can't study my practice because I've been asked to follow a text so closely that I don't feel like I have the opportunity to innovate and test different solutions. And so STEP really challenges that notion, but it may not work in that environment. <laughs> It certainly challenges that environment, but it may not work in that particular environment. So we have to be really cognizant of that. Prior to implementing it with teachers, what we want to ask is the principal, are you open to changing the way that you're implementing this reading program or math program, for example? Because STEP requires that openness. So last thing before we talk a little bit more, this is the continuum that we're trying to impact with STEP. Imagine this is about PLCs. We want to take PLCs from the left side to the right side. When it comes to focus on student learning, we want to move from unfocused PLCs to an exploration of a common challenge. Focus not on student learning is the left side. We're trying to shift to practices to accelerate learning. And then focus on unproven practices. They might be great when I read about them in that book, but are they proven in my context? We want to Proof to come first. So there's a series of these things. I'd like for you to just take a moment to reflect on two or three of the things that are most relevant for you. So as you read from left to right, which of the things are, are most relevant for you that you want to try and impact in your own context, whether that be as a teacher in this room, a principal in this room, um, an organizer or leader of multiple schools, which of the things do you need to work on or want to work on most? Write those two or three things down on your scratch pads, on your pieces of paper, because we're going to do something with those in just a minute.
there's just a question about being able to access this. So this presentation will be loaded to the conference website so you can access it. So don't feel like you have to write all of this down. I'm sorry I didn't say that ahead of time. Um, but this resource will be provided for you. So um, the reason I wanted you to focus on just one, two, or maybe three sort of areas that you want to work on in this continuum is because I want you to think about how STEP applies for you. Remember that improvement principle of being user-centered? I'm trying to practice that right now in a group of, I don't know, 40 or 50 people that I've never met. <laughs> um, and so this is my attempt. We'll see if it works. If I fail, hopefully I learn from it. Um, so with the two or three things that are most relevant for you. So for example, if in your case, you feel like there's already a lot of trust that you have highly trained facilitators, but the area that you really want to work on is this continuous teacher learning, the second item, weak or no measurement. We want to move from weak or no measurement to robust measurement. Is that something that is sort of a, a point that you need to improve on in your context, in your school? Or is it that you have strong personalities that dominate the conversations and you want to try to move to more humility as a learner. So based on the one, two, or maybe three at the most, things that you want to try and impact in your context, I'd love for you to think about you've written down the ideal state. If you wrote down the things on the right side, humility as a learner, that's the ideal state. We want humility as a learner. So if you have that written down, the next thing I want you to think about together, first individually and then maybe with some support from a partner is, what are your current assets? What are the current things that you have that you can start to leverage or access to help you impact and move from strong personalities to humility as a learner? That may be, you may have someone, an asset might be, I have a coach in my building who can facilitate these conversations. So while they're two strong personalities, that objective observer to facilitate that conversation would be tremendously helpful. That's an asset. What's the challenge that I have? I have a challenge in that we don't have a lot of time because the instructional coach is so busy doing other things. So then what's your next step? Your next step may be to have a conversation either with the coach, with the school leader, to say, here's what we're trying to do. Share this, share this with them. Share your pain point. Share step. And say, it's really important in a step model that we have humility as learners. Would you be willing to give me 30 minutes of your time, instructional coach, or a school leader, would you be willing to ask the instructional coach to spend 30 minutes with our grade level team as we collaborate so that we can figure out ways to have more humility and that that conversation can be facilitated so that it's not strong personalities dominating. But I want you to start to carry the load right now. I've been talking a lot in this last hour. I want you to start to do the thinking. And so for whichever one of these things that you're trying to impact, pick one, write it down as your ideal state, list your current asset. If you have one, great. If you have more, list them. List your current challenge and some next steps for you. Take about five minutes to do that, please. Okay, welcome back. Um, I know that we are running short on time. And um, I also know that my job as the facilitator is to not go over by 10, 20, or 30 minutes because we have to make up the time um, from this morning so that you can stay on track for your next sessions. So I apologize for the limited time. And apologize for the limited sort of think time that you had on this. But I wanted to give you just an opportunity to start to at least experience a few things. One, what the step process looks like. We do this same type of thinking when we facilitate our coaches. Um, when we facilitate an initial meeting oftentimes with principals well, how, is how this starts. So that principals can ask, is this right for our building? So we'll often start with the principal. Um, and these are some of the things we share with them. We ask them what they're trying to solve. We do some of the things that I just shared with you in this presentation to start to um, see if it's a right fit, if step is appropriate. The last thing I want to share real briefly with you are some key ingredients of step. So we talked about the research behind it. We talked about the framework, and you've experienced some of the thinking that happens. You looked at some results as well. 
What are some, as you get like really granular into the process, the key ingredients of STEP? There's three or four really key ingredients. The first is skilled facilitation. We talked about that. So when you're moving from to this idea of humility as a learner, it takes skilled facilitation. It also takes skilled facilitation for, to make sure that the group participating in STEP, a group of teachers, feels vulnerable enough to share failure, to share data, and to say, that didn't work in my classroom. Let's figure out a way to make it better. And so oftentimes in our experience, when we start the STEP process, without that skilled facilitation, we start to get strong personalities dominating. Um, and the process breaks down. So skill facilitation is really important. Um, and it's really about admitting something that perhaps is not working. It's also, the opposite is also true, by the way. We found that teachers who have really impressive practices and are getting impactful results, oftentimes are nervous about sharing that with their colleagues. And so... The skilled facilitation is as much about that and promoting that practice as it is about being vulnerable with things that aren't working. Um, this is an activity that I would have done with you where we start to learn about personalities in the room. We did a different kind of personality uh, profile in our leadership meeting yesterday, but this is one where we ask teachers to think about which of these objects are you most like and why. Because... That helps us understand points of view and perspective in a very simple way, which is important to facilitating conversation. So we're not going to do that. Um, data and measurement is another key ingredient, key ingredient number two. So I talked a little bit about this, but having the data systems in place to help you print reports to um, even just data literacy. So teachers who are working on this, understanding what good assessment and data practices look like is an important part of this. And so oftentimes when we implement STEP, we do some sort of data literacy boot camps and talk about, because teachers are developing their own assessments oftentimes. If I don't have a series of assessments that will help me test the practice I'm trying to solve or, or confirm that it works. So we're developing our own formative assessments, our summative assessments. So understanding what a good formative and summative assessment looks like is part of data literacy. This is oftentimes what step teams produce when they um, are, are pulling together a data set when they're studying a practice. In this case, their practice they were challenging, studying was academic vocabulary. They listed some different promising practices. They then identified the instruments that were going to be used to test those practices. What were the indicators that they were looking for? and then an average pre-score, average post-score, the percent change, and the number of students included in that sample set. So this is just a summary of when we get together as a STEP team, we're populating these kinds of data tables to give you sort of a snapshot of what the data, the robust nature of data looks like in a STEP process and meeting. Key ingredient three is leadership and culture. It's both about top-down and bottom-up. So it's not just teachers collaborating, it's principals putting in the conditions for success for that collaboration to happen. Key ingredient four is context and content knowledge. So what's interesting about this is that if science teachers are getting together to collaborate around science, we want to have pretty deep content knowledge around science, right? And so to test a practice of what a biology or chemistry, we want those folks to be really accessing that deep content knowledge so it's more user-centered. The problem is more user-centered. It's not the principal saying, I've been a school leader. I never taught chemistry. I taught language arts. I can't go into that chemistry teacher's classroom and say, I can give them general pedagogical feedback, but I can't give them content-specific feedback. That's an important part of STEP, but it's an opportunity because if five chemistry teachers are collaborating together, they can give each other content feedback. We've also accessed video-based observation for this. We have a video-based observation platform where teachers video themselves. They then collaborate with the teacher across the world, across the country, across the county, whatever it is, and they give each other feedback from one chemistry teacher to the next because one of the constraints we often find is that in a small school, there's only one chemistry teacher. So we don't have another person to give that teacher content expertise or help. So the video-based observation platform is called Advance, 
and it helps solve that problem. The playbook I mentioned, if you're interested in the playbook, I'll be happy to send you some uh, resources around the playbook. And here's where you can find me on Twitter and insideducationgroup.com. My email is just stricker at insideducationgroup.com. But here's some more information on us. I apologize that I went incredibly fast in that presentation. It was a 90-minute presentation, and we did it in about 60. <laughs> so thanks for your time. <laughs>